Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to share uh, my screen. Yes. Yes. I don't know if you can, can you see it well? And yes. The mode? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. So well, thank you a lot uh, for the introduction and the invitation uh, uh, to give this lecture about uh, living uh, microreads. You have more information, by the way, in our Center for Research on Microreads is the website, uh, EPAUDK, and uh, you are welcome also to, to take a look on that. Um, uh, Let's talk about uh, what is uh, a microgrid. Microgrid is indeed a concept in which we can have renewable energies and uh, let's say energy storage systems and consumption all together. So let's say as close as possible. This concept right now has been expanded to many other areas like for instance, water, they call uh, micronets, also food production also uh, when we talk about the zero kilometer uh, production of food and uh, consumption and storage and and also close ecologic systems which i will talk also today so uh, i think it's a very nice concept in which we can rethink the way that we are generating consuming and and storing the the energy this is a picture of our members so also thanks for our 50 members in our uh, research center and uh, because part of this uh, presentation is it, thanks to them uh, here you can see also our uh, microwave laboratories uh, we use a number of cabinets uh, to emulate uh, microwave systems and grid uh, ac and dc uh, grid emulators also so we basically use uh, what is called also hardware in the loop concepts uh, from matlab simulating we are able to develop controllers compile, send to uh, digital signal processors, and then implement uh, our ideas, our hardware. And you can see here some smart meters. I will talk about that. So basically, we use what is also called our hardware in the loop. Uh, the only part which is virtual are the generators, batteries, and loads, but all about the power converters, smart meters, uh, relays, uh, transformers are physically in, in our laboratories. Uh, and also, we can make tests because this laboratory is a multi microgrid system laboratory. We can make tests of multi microgrid clusters and also virtual power plants. Uh, these are some pictures of these laboratory facilities. Uh, right now, we have here an amazing lecture about the wind uh, generation. So, we have also, of course, in Denmark, a lot of wind, uh, also solar, and uh, we have also uh, developing. Uh, prototypes also for companies like, for instance, Zonen, which uh, develop battery systems for homes. Uh, and we have also collaboration with Typhoon Hill to develop also all these platforms that finally has to go, let's say, in the real systems. That's, that's another hardware in the loop uh, systems that we have also in our laboratory facilities. Our research frames uh, in our center are basically four. The first one is microgrid clusters, how to clusterize microgrids. The second one is digitalization and Internet of Things. Fourth and very important, maritime microgrids in ships and ports. And uh, number four is space microgrids. Space microgrids, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Microgrids in satellites and also post ecosystems for future moon and Mars uh, bases. So here you can see some pictures of our uh, demonstration house which we have a number of appliances, some of them with IoT capabilities. Again, the picture uh, from the rooftop. Uh, this is our uh, demonstration uh, smart home with the kitchen, the control room, the living room, and here some pictures. You can imagine that we have lots of sensors here and monitoring all the electric system as well, uh, thanks to Zigbee uh, interconnection. So we have developed together with another company in Denmark called Develco. Uh, there are smart plugs that are connected through Zigbee to our uh, central controller. Uh, you can see here a picture of some of these uh, Develco uh, meter in which we are measuring the, the wind turbine power and we have a switch also. And then we have this is the typical smart meter that we have here in Denmark. The same I have here at home or many other people uses. Um, 
and here you can see also our uh, our generation uh, changes inside by taking the just the measurements from the smart meter and all the other uh, monitoring let's say sensors uh, temperatures uh, air quality sensor also which is becoming more and more important here and what is very interesting is that from smart metering we can also uh, observe which is the appliance that we have connected. For instance, from an aggregated, let's say, measurement from the smart meter, we can disaggregate the information and we can know that there is an electric heater connected or a microwave or a fridge. Yeah? This is also called non-intrusive load monitoring because we don't need to put a sensor in each of our appliance. Yeah, And uh, thanks to that, we can also develop uh, home energy management systems. And when we think about integrating smart meters, some people think about electricity, but we have also meters of heat, meter, uh, meters of water, meters of gas, and all these things are integrated in, in our houses here in Denmark. So, so it's, it's really a very holistic approach when we talk about the smart metering. And uh, of course, when we have a number of smart meters here, for instance, in Denmark, we can take up to 500 houses, uh, collect information for the utility, and then present the information, especially power quality. Uh, the important thing is that not only the utility can take it from the blue line here, but also you can get it from home. So you can use your own uh, signal uh, through an optic eye that you can plug to a laptop by, by using a USB. So it's uh, kind of very easy. And these are real measurements uh, from a three-phase system. Here in our houses, we have three phase. So you can see one of these phases are unbalanced. So that's very interesting to observe. And also depending on the hour, uh, there is some under voltage or over, over voltage. So we can know exactly if we are inside the limits. And I, I will say that this is amazing, especially now that we can see more electric vehicles plugging inside our system. Yeah. So this is how looks our uh, IoT demonstration home uh, together with all the appliances and, and also the district heating uh, floor system. But after years researching uh, microgrids, I decided to also become a prosumer myself. So this is uh, my house. I installed uh, solar panels, uh, 2.4 kilowatt. This is my car, it's a Nissan Leaf that have a 30 kilowatt hour battery system. And I install as well an electric vehicle charger of 3.7 kilowatt. So I did like a doctor taking your own pills. Yeah. For instance, one of my favorite doctors is Dr. House. Maybe you know from his series that normally the illness is lupus. And I will say that when you try to study uh, control of electric systems, normally what you need is maybe a PI control, no? So I will say that this is very interesting also from the uh, TV series. And I hear that it's also an Arabic uh, statement. which say, if you really want to do something, you will find a way. Otherwise, don't worry, you will find the excuse. Yeah. So I think that, that now is the moment that we have to find the ways to integrate also ourselves more renewables. And um, many people right now are talking about artificial intelligence, right? But do we really know how our brain works? Because it's very interesting to see that we have really three brains. We have 80,000 million neurons in our mind, but it has been discovered that also in our heart, we have 40,000 neurons in our heart. And in our gut, on the digestion system, we have 500 million neurons, the equivalent of a brain's of the cat's brain. So it's really a distributed system. And if you look at, for instance, the Indian uh, idea of the chakras, they have some centers of energy. And I will say that they coincide very well where we have this neuron, right? Brain, heart, and gut. Yeah. So that's uh, really amazing. Another thing is that how much we use our brain. We have here that Normally, we use maybe 5%, 10% of our brain, and so forth. We have to be very relaxed on that. We use 100% of our brain, it's been demonstrated. However, simultaneously, due to 
limitations of glucose and oxygen, we only can use it 2% at the same time. Yeah. At the same time. This is four watt exactly of electricity. We have electric gain, four watt of electricity simultaneously. However, we normally use similar net neural network paths. We used to use the same paths. That's why it's difficult to change sometimes, right? We want to change our behaviors, but it change it it is difficult. Yeah. Very interesting also. Looking at the brain, we can see that we have indeed inside three levels. We have the reptilian brain, this brain more action, reaction, searching for opportunities, 500 million years. Then we have the limbic brain, which is more for mammals, you know, like dog, cats, etc. 100 million uh, brains. This is more the emotional part, where we feel the emotions. And then we have the neocortex, only 100,000 years. This is what defines us as, as human beings. And I will say that the most amazing part is the frontal part of this neocortex, which allow us to go to the future, anticipate what will happen and come back to the present moment to take a decision. This is something that other animals cannot do. And this is really amazing, right? This is in the neocortex. However, major part of our decisions are taken in the limbic brain by emotion. Yeah, so emotionally, we take a decision and then the part of neocortex, the rational part comes with the justification. That's also something <laughs> complicated to, to deal with. Another important thing, we hear that stress is not good, stress, stress. No, uh, indeed, many studies demonstrate that uh, moderated levels of stress are good and you can generate dopamine and noradrenaline so you can activate more your skills of learning, attention, and so on. However, if the stress is very, very high, then of course, efficiency curve goes down and, and appears uh, anger, violence, uh, syndrome of burnout, I will say. Another important thing, how our heart communicates with our brain. There is a bidirectional communication between our neural networks that are in the heart and the brain. However, it has been discovered by Heart Math Institute in Germany there is more information going from the heart to the brain than from the brain to the heart. So sometimes I wonder who's the boss here, right? You can see here also some heart rhythm paths. Some people think that heart beats must be constant. This is not true. What is happening is that heart beats are changing all the time in order to maintain the blood pressure constant. So what sometimes we measure is the average. You can see here when we have feelings of frustration, anxiety, worry, irritation, how this heart rate has a lot of harmonics and a very non-coherent, uh, non-periodic signal. However, when we feel positive emotions, appreciation, love, courage, you can see how we have a almost pure sinusoidal uh, waveform in this heart rate. So that I will say that is also something very, uh, really amazing about this field. And just finally about the heart, knowing that it have 5,000 bigger electromagnetic field than the brain, and this signal can be measured in more than three meters at a distance. So, so it's something that some people also study heart synchronization. Sometimes it can happen to people uh, that feeling love together, they can synchronize the, their hearts even without touching each other. That's amazing. Let's talk about also a uh, microwave control. And you can see here the primary control, which is more like this action reaction brain, right? Like the, uh, yeah, you can see here the droop controllers, which reacts again active and reactive powers. But today we have a lot of equipment that already use these concepts, like you can see Fronius or a uh, Victron have really these frequency uh, control systems and allow us to, to implement real microwaves. Yeah, so here you can see the also the control of a microwave system. We have the primary control, which uh, it's like, I will say like this reptilian brain action reaction, secondary control, which tries to restore not only frequency, but also voltage because we are in a microwave system. And 
I will say that it's kind of the limbic brain. And then we have the energy management system in the tertiary control, this brain that allows us to go to the future and then come back to the present moment and take uh, actions like our uh, neocortex, which is this tertiary control. Uh, so that's something nice. We can also have controllers more centralized or more distributed. There is no a single solution. Uh, so sometimes we kind of decentralize more the, the lower levels and more centralize the, the higher levels of, of control. And this also allows us to uh, interconnect microgrids together so we can have higher levels of control which are without uh, disconnecting, let's say, all the communication systems that has been developed. Another important effect is the whack a mole effect. This is a, a game in Korea, very famous. So people is whacking a mole, and the mole appears in another part of this table. This happened a lot when we try to, for instance, compensate harmonics in some parts of the grid, and then these harmonics appears in other parts. Uh, in Japan, they have a lot of experience about this, installing active filters, and then, yeah, kind of trying to find where is the, the optimum point. And then talking about Japan, also we have some microgrids there. This is a DC microgrid system in, in uh, Sendai. And that's a number of solar panels with uh, gensets and fuel cell system. And this is very close to Fukushima. Yeah. And what happened the day of the disaster, now almost yeah, nine years ago, um, it was uh, March 11, 2011. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, the earthquake. And, and at that moment, uh, the microgrid was working in Ireland during three days. This microgrid was supporting the hospital. So you can imagine that that day was a big mess and also supporting the telecom so people could uh, call home, etc. So it's, it's important thing because we can see how renewable energy systems could support a disaster from other kind of energies. And uh, if we go also a little bit at home, we can see that many technologies are appearing. This is just one uh, picture from my Nissan Leaf in which you have a fast charger here on uh, DC and then the slow charger is integrated inside your car. So we have several levels of voltage, et cetera. And uh, you can see also that right now we have the possibility also of using the battery connected to, to your house in a bi-directional way. So right now there are more companies developing this concept. And I will say that because right now we are extending a lot of hours working at home, it makes more and more sense than installing stationary batteries. Uh, other places in which more electric systems are appearing is electric vehicles. So we have uh, aircrafts, of course, cars, ships, and, and other existing. So in the case of uh, aircraft, we have, for instance, the Boeing 787, which have uh, some parts on electric. Of course, the main drivers are not electric, but they have auxiliary starter generator uh, units that are pure electric. And you can see uh, here that we have a number of AC microgrid systems on 230 volt on the airplane. And then we have a number of AC microgrid systems, bipolar ones, plus, minus, and zero, 270 volt in DC integrated with, with battery system. So it's becoming really a microgrid as well. Another place in which microgrids are appearing is in ships. So you can see more and more ships uh, having electric systems and batteries. And this is happening here also. For instance, we have in the south of Denmark, uh, full electric ferries and hybrid electric ferries as well. Uh, some of these technologies are moving also to DC. So we have more and more uh, ships uh, moving to DC technologies also. Uh, however, the problem here is that even though the deficiency could be higher, then we have problems with the, then you can have problems with the protection systems. Some developments has been done with Siemens and ABB. So you can see that you have a DC bus. And, and then of course, the more, the higher is the distance because in some ships, these lines are really long. Then uh, of course you have more losses. So you have to increase more and more the voltage levels beyond 1000 volt. You start to have chips moving to 3.3 or 6.6 kilovolt. So then, uh, as I mentioned before, protection system is, is really a problem. And uh, why some uh, ships are moving from AC to DC? 
it's not because DC is more efficient, which is basically not true, not a general statement, but because our synchronous generators are more, let's say, uh, efficient in some point of operation. When we move to AC, we have 50 or 60 hertz, so they are fixed uh, in this operation, and that means that for different operation conditions, efficiency can change a lot. You only have one uh, optimum operation point. However, if we move to DC, we can adjust the rotation speed according to which is uh, the load that is demand. So you will have a more flat uh, consumption. Talking about also ships, we have more uh, problems with the or challenges to the ports, let's say, because some ships arrive to the port and they start burning uh, diesel or oil to generate electricity because for instance, they arrive with a freezer with a lot of fish. Uh, because of that, we provide them more and more in Europe a uh, dock station so you can pack your uh, ship to the main port. But this, of course, is a challenge because we need different voltages and different frequencies, and we need to increase the electric infrastructure in our port. That's why these kind of configurations are appearing, especially here in the north of Europe. So a number of inverters working on 50 or 60, depending on the ship, uh, where it comes from, different voltage levels, and then a, a common DC microgrid system, which is connected to medium voltage. So rectification, and then uh, just, just choosing which is the, the appropriate ship. Another uh, challenge point are the cranes. Some of these cranes are still uh, burning uh, diesel, and this is uh, another uh, point of CO2 emissions, very important to reduce in the next years. So that's why uh, we are substituting also all these diesel generators by connections to uh, the main point of electricity. Uh, on the cranes, once you need to lift up a container and appears the, the, the ship, lift up, you need to inject energy. However, when you lift down those containers, you can convert this motor to a generator. So instead of burning the electricity in dummy resistors, you can reuse it. And according to uh, the last studies, you can get uh, between 40 and 50% of energy recovery. This is a lot, I can tell you, this is a lot. So you can reduce also the power, uh, the energy consumption in the, port, in the port and also reduce uh, the peak of electricity needed. Finish with the, with the marine systems, we go to the space and you can see how more and more in nanosatellites we have also DC microgrid systems, including photovoltaic systems, battery systems, and also very pulsating loads, cameras, communication systems. Here, the challenge is that we have cosmic radiation. So this means that the sun is uh, radiating photons and many other particles that deteriorates uh, the photovoltaic systems and also can hang up the microprocessors. So it's very important here that all those controllers are analog controllers. The microprocessor is only a supervisor because it's very easy that can be hang up. So here, analog electronics becomes very, very important. And this is big news because we thought that analog electronics was Almost dead, and here we really need good analog electronics des designers. Yeah, so that's uh, an amazing field of research, I will say. And finally, I want to show you one example of how we can implement some ideas that we have been developed for uh, electric microgrid systems to be translated to closed ecosystems. This is a project together with the European Space Agency and the University Barcelona, uh, Autonome of Barcelona. And in that case, what we want to do is give a life support system to the uh, astronauts, provide oxygen, water, food, etc. This is to create a small ecosystem. We have been seen that this small ecosystem, uh, we provide water and CO and uh, oxygen to the crew members. And of course we have waste. So from this waste, we are, you can imagine, we uh, can get also uh, nitrates and minerals. 
And then here, what we do is we subtract the CO2 and get the oxygen. Of course, you have some photosynthesis here from the microalgae and from some higher plants. This is the plant uh, which is placed in Barcelona from the uh, European Space Agency. The nitrification compartment, photo bio, uh, bio reactor, and here is the plant compartment. And in our case, the crew compartment, in that case, are rats because we are still making the, the test with, in the laboratory. And here is very important to fix the oxygen in a very high requirements of around 20%. Uh, otherwise, if it's higher or lower, the crew members can die. So that's very important to fix it. Uh, so this becomes a closed loop system. However, it's very difficult to control because here we have hundreds of um, state variables with high non-linearities. So it's really a very complex system. Yeah. So what we did here is we observed that microreads and closed ecosystems have some parallelism, you know, when they make the photosynthesis is kind of similar as our photovoltaic system. When we store oxygen, it's similar than when we store electricity. And then here we have microbial fuel cells, which are similar as our hydrogen fuel cells. So we could develop similar control systems. And right now we are testing with very good results uh, by using the same hierarchical control structure that we did for microreads. So what we did in the past control in the primary control voltage and current here is mass flow regulation. In the secondary control, it was voltage and frequency restoration. In that case is corrective actions, prescriptions for the flow dispatching. And the tertiary control, which is the energy management system of our microgrid. In this case, is a level of control that designed the long-term optimal operation set points for the entire plant. So I think that's an amazing thing because we can uh, control one close ecologic system the same way as an isolated microgrid. So that's, I would say, a very nice result. Just for finalize, uh, give you thanks. And I would like to finalize with this statement from Arnold Schwarzenegger, who said the future is green energy, sustainability, and renewable energy. Thank you very much.